I've talked a lot about icons, but I have never actually mentioned what an icon is supposed to be. I'll start by saying what an icon is not. It is not a realistic, secular likeness of an individual. Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, talking about tourists who have visited the Holy Mountain, Mount Athos, said that many people come looking for art and never actually get to see an icon because they're looking for a work of art. An icon is not a work of art, it is a window, a window into a transfigured reality, reality as it exists, transfigured by the light of Mount Tabor. Iconography is a language. First of all, icons are written, iconografia, the writing of icons, because they all tell a lesson, they all tell a story, they all transmit to us a meaning that is difficult to transmit simply in words. There's a language of color, there's a language of gesture, there's a language of expression, and there's a language of perspective. The easiest to talk about is the language of color. And bear in mind that for every rule there are exceptions, so you will find varying interpretations of specific colors. But I'll tell you about what our common practice is. Uh, the color gold is the light of Christ, the light of the Creator, the light of the transfiguration, the light in which we all live, but few are pri privileged to uh, see, to be conscious of. The color blue is associated with created matter. Created matter, when touched by the light of Christ, changes. The closer one comes to the source of the light, the more that created matter is changed by the, being in the presence of the source of the light. The color red or reddish purple is the color of kingship. In the uh, old Byzantine Empire, uh, only royalty was permitted to wear the color purple. Keeping those ideas in mind, if you look at the icon to the right of the royal doors on the icon screen, the icon of Christ, you will see all those colors. Uh, you will see that his inner garment is red or reddish purple, and it has a gold panel on it. His outer garment is blue-green. This reminds us that Christ was always both our King and our God, and yet he chose to wrap himself up in humanity uh, for the purpose of dying on the cross and achieving the reopening of the doors of paradise to us. If you look at the icon to the left of the royal doors, you will see the, the Mother of God, Most Holy Theotokos, robed in those same colors, but they are opposite the arrangement of the vestments on Christ. Her inner garment is blue-green. She was always a human being, no different from us other than in that she kept herself from falling into sin. Her outer garment is reddish purple with a gold fringe. She, a human being, cannot comprehend how she could possibly be the mother of the Creator, the mother of our Lord and God. And the angel tells her, the Spirit of God will cover you. And so she is covered with the symbol of royalty and divinity. But there's another difference. The gold expressed on the vestments of Christ is a solid panel. The gold on the vestments of the Mother of God consists of individual threads. You'll see those same threads on the priest's epitrachilion, 
uh, which is the basic liturgical garment that he puts on. Uh, you'll see it on the orarian held up by the deacon when he calls people to prayer. When he says, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. All of those threads represent all of us. The priest puts on humanity, puts on the entire church when he puts on the epitrachilion. The fringe on the vestment, the outer vestment of the mother of God reminds us that when she became the mother of God incarnate, we all became family. I give a lot of tours to disparate groups and invariably a uh, question arises, why are your icons so two-dimensional? And I say, they're not. But people look at them and they say, well, they look flat. And I say, you haven't been looking very carefully. They are not two-dimensional, they are beyond three-dimensional. If I were to ask anyone to draw me a picture of a house, a person standing next to the house on a road that goes past the house, up through the woods, into the mountains. I don't know what level of artistic talent the person will have, but he'll draw me a big house, a smaller person, a road that becomes progressively narrower, trees that become smaller and smaller as they go into the background until they reach the vanishing point at the horizon. This is classic perspective. In iconography, the exact opposite happens. We begin with a reality which is visible to our eyes, which is intellectually apprehendable. And then we go beyond peripheral vision in all directions. We see more than is visible to our limited intellect, our limited senses. Look at the icon of uh, Christ on the icon screen. He's holding a gospel. Uh, for your information, the text that he's holding is the, come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. We see both pages of the text, which means that the artist, the iconographer, must be directly in front of his subject. And yet we see the bottom, end, uh, the bottom of the pages, and we see the page, the end papers on the left and on the right, which no individual from any vantage point could possibly see because at least one of them will be beyond his or her peripheral vision. Our vision expands beyond what is objectively there to draw more information from what is before us. If you look at the hair of the Christ, a lot of people will say it's a bouffant hairdo. This is not correct. Uh, it's actually uh, that shape because you are seeing it from the front, from the top, and from the sides simultaneously. What is being used here is reverse perspective. You begin in the foreground with an objective reality and then expand in all directions. Look at the icons on the royal doors, the four evangelists and the scene of the Annunciation at Nazareth. You will see that the chairs upon which the evangelists sit, the footstools, all begin in the foreground and expand in different directions, opening up our vision to more than is objectively visible there. If you look at the scene of Nazareth behind the Mother of God and fix on any individual detail, your eye will be drawn outward in various directions and you will move from place to place to place. You'll look at the ceiling of the structure behind her and you'll realize that you're seeing not only the ceiling and its supports but also the top and the back of the roof. 
going beyond what is immediately apparent. This is also a conscious device. The Christ was with most of his disciples for three years. He did many things with them. He worked many, many miracles. He healed the sick, raised the dead, uh, gave eyes to the blind, cleansed the leper, cursed the fig tree, and said, and I will be handed over into the hands of men and will be killed. And on the third day, I will be resurrected. How many people accepted that? We know from the services of Passion Week, no one did. That when the myrrh-bearing women came to his tomb, the f very early, the first day of the following week, uh, they were there to anoint a dead body. And instead they met an angel who explained to them, you shouldn't be looking for the living among the dead, he's risen as he told you he would be. Well, why did not they believe in those three years what he had told them? He appears to the disciples in the closed room on Mount Zion, and they immediately think he's a ghost. Why did, not, did they not believe uh, that he was the risen Christ as he promised to be? Their intellects are not yet prepared. He eats before them. He allows them to poke around in the nail holes in his hands. He allows uh, St. Thomas to stick his hand between his ribs. And then they all come to believe when their hearts, their senses, their minds, their intellects, their souls, all came together to fully accept the reality of what was there. They see reality in a different way, a transfigured reality. And then they're capable of believing. And you'll note that in the Gospels, it says that then Jesus explained to them the meaning of the scriptures. Again, until they believed in the reality of the resurrection, of the incarnation, the resurrection, and the presence of their Lord and God among them, they were not ready to fully understand the meaning of the scriptures. Uh, there is a point in the liturgy of the pre-sanctified when the priest turns to the congregation. And he is holding uh, a censer and a candle and simply says, the light of Christ enlightens all until you have accepted and understood the essence of Christ. It's hard to understand any of the, the rest of the scriptures. We begin with a secular reality, see it in the light of Christ, and learn much, much more from it. There's a language of gesture. In looking at icons of uh, saints who are bishops, you will see uh, them holding their hands like so. The, the right hand is held uh, in a Greek uh, acronym. There, you have the letter Iota, the index finger, the letter Sigma, the middle finger, the thumb and the ring finger are crossed in the He, and then there's the letter Sigma again, ESHS, Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. That's the contemporary sign of priestly blessing. Several hundred years ago, there was a slightly different manner of giving the priestly blessing, and that was like so, the letter Yota, the letter Sigma, and all the three remaining fingers together, Jesus, E-S, the fullness of the Holy Trinity. You look at the icon of Christ, and his hand is like so. And people have complained, this is a very anomalous kind of image. This, this doesn't comport to conte our contemporary understanding of how the Christ is to be depicted. Well, this is an expression that dates from ancient times. It says, it is not I who am blessing you on behalf of Jesus Christ, who is the fullness of the Trinity. 
I am the source of the blessing. A great deal can be learned simply from gesture. The, probably the most difficult thing to understand is the language of expression. Every tour group that comes into this church is asked to please blurt out an immediate response to the question, look at all the icons and tell me what emotion you see. Adults are hesitant but they, because they wait to find out what uh, is expected of them. No one wants to stand out. Fifth and sixth graders who have uh, no hesitancy about expressing what they see or what they feel give me interesting answers. If a tour group comes here early in the morning, it's their first visit to a Russian Orthodox Church, or it's their first visit to Washington, they see happiness, joy, ecstasy, love. If they've been wandering around from museum to museum all day, it's uh, almost time for them to go back to school. They see bitterness, sternness, uh, criticism. None of that is in the icons. It's all up here. Uh, the iconographer attempts to depict something that is very, very difficult to put in words. The concept of apathia, not apathy. Apathia is dispassion. Some people will tell me, well, there's, there's really no expression on their faces. Not true. It's an expression which is intended to show you that we are in the world, but not of the world. That no matter what is going, around, uh, going on around us, we are always in the light of Christ. We are always um, separate from at the same time we are in this reality, we are already uh, touching upon uh, the greater world, the world, the kingdom of God. Backtracking a bit, I mentioned uh, that gold is the light of Christ and you've probably noticed that on virtually all of the icons, there are gold nimby, gold halos, uh, surrounding the faces of the saints depicted. If you look at icons which have a scene in the background, you will see that the background color is usually gold. Moscow school icons, uh, a lot of them have the color red in the background. As I said, there are uh, exceptions to all rules. But the color of the gold in the in the nimbus is no different from the color gold of the background. We are not saying that the people depicted are somehow special in that they are unlike us. We all live surrounded by the light of Christ. We are all called to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. We are all called to manifest that light as we bear witness to the Christian faith in the world. Those people who are recognized as consciously living in that light, either by their teaching, by their evangelical activity, by their uh, working of miracles, by uh, their prayerful life, by their Christian example, are uh, depicted with that light surrounding their faces. Unlike in Western art, where sometimes you'll have a ring above the person or a plate type of uh, object behind the person, these aren't intrinsic characteristics. Uh, they aren't a, separate, a thing separate from the overall light of Christ. We're all called to live in the light of Christ. If you look at icons on the walls, you'll see that many of them feature people holding crosses. Whenever you see someone holding a cross, this is a sign of martyrdom. 
we are used to thinking of martyrdom in terms of people being uh, thrown to their death or tortured to death for their faith. That's not the meaning of the word martyros. A martyr is a one who is a witness. These people bear witness to the truth of Christ, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the light of Christ. And they are not pictured as triumphant. They are not pictured as looking down upon us uh, as if they are superior to us. The faces are of any given, uh, done by any given iconographer, will be one single face. If you go along a row of icons on the walls, you'll see that whether it's an old person, a young person, the face is the same. You look at the uh, faces of the women and imagine adding a beard to that face and then look at the opposite wall, you'll see that same face with beards represented. Uh, men, women, we all share the same image. We are made in the image of and after the likeness of God. And any individual iconographer will attempt to depict one coherent image uh, in uh, the faces of the saints. Not I who live, but Christ who lives in me, as St. Paul tells us. The last part of uh, this discussion has to do with uh, that uh, feeling. What, what does it, what does apathia really uh, mean in, in real secular terms? For that, uh, I would suggest that you look at an oil lamp. The easiest way to talk about apathia or dispassion is using the example of an oil lamp. Perhaps you have a uh, kerosene lantern at home uh, or you have oil lamps before your icons. Uh, the principle is the same. Basically you have a container of oil and uh, within it uh, either suspended on a float as in this case or uh, simply held by a clamp is uh, a wick made of cotton. If you want more light, you pull up the wick. If you want less light, you pull down the wick. This is not giving a lot of light. Should I want to increase the brightness, I pull up the wick. But if I do so, I notice that it starts to smoke. That's because there is a greater surface area of cotton um, in flame and the flame is hotter and very quickly it consumes the wick and burns out. Well, I say to myself, I certainly don't want that. I'll pull it down as low as possible and just have this little light. I do that and just standing here and talking over the wick would be enough of a breeze to put it out. Somewhere in between those two extremes, there's a golden mean in which you have a light that is constant, but not so strong as to be self-consuming. If one were to honestly look at the faces of the saints depicted on the walls, one could see that they are burning with that quiet light. Uh, it is not a passionate light. It is not an outrageously bright light but it is constant and yet not self-consuming. This is what we're all called to be. We're all called to be living in that constant light, no matter what happens. <clears throat> you look at the people holding crosses. Uh, they are martyrs. Most of them died horrible deaths. And you look at their faces and you think, well, so what? Yes, they died. Yes, they suffered for a, a period of time. But compared to life in eternity with God, 
at something that's insignificant. And so their expression reflects that feeling. The example that I use when I give tours, um, imagine that I have a group of people around me and suddenly I say, oh, there's a show and tell, there's, a, there's something I need to show you that's over at the other end of the church. And I go running through the crowd and stomp on the little toe of one of the people there and say, excuse me, as I go by. It hurts. I weigh 220 pounds. It's going to hurt. Um, but how does the person respond to my saying, excuse me? Um, person can hold off and hit me. The person can criticize me for my clumsiness and my obesity. Um, the person can say, oh, that's okay. That's all right, no problem, and hate me for the rest of the week because the pain is throbbing. Or the person can say, God forgives, and just get on with what we're doing. In each of those cases, there's been a, a, a meeting with a passion. In the last of the examples, the passion has been experienced, and we go on. So what? The level of the pain hasn't changed, but in the first three responses, the person has allowed the passion to take over. And this is another reminder to us in that expression of apathia, that we cannot avoid temptation. Temptation will come. We cannot avoid being exposed to the passions that comes with the territory of living in a fallen world. But we need not allow the passion to rule us. We need to burn with a constant light, not a self-consuming light. Our day generally begins, in the liturgical sense, with the evening. The culmination of the Vesper service is the evening entrance when we hear the hymn Sveti uh, Tichi or Fossi Laros in Greek, uh, gladsome light. It's a very quiet hymn and a very quiet light. We are seeing our world at the close of day, close of the secular day, when the glare of noon no longer interferes with our being able to see many, many details that would otherwise be obscured. And we can reflect on just what we have been given by God in that quiet light, which is Ilaros, which is uh, happy, gladsome. Uh, we can thank Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for what he, we have been given. Use many words to express what is expressed in every single face that you see in this church. <laughs>